So when biases come to mind, what did you think when you saw my picture before this event? What did you think when I came up here? So would it surprise you to know that I grew up identifying as two races, Native American and Caucasian? That is unconscious bias. It's bias happening in our brains, making incredibly quick judgments and assessments of people and situations without us even realizing. So how did I get here? The topic of conscious and unconscious bias had never been more prevalent than right now. Help me understand your perspective on oftentimes being the only person in the room. You have to be bringing them into an environment that is truly inclusive, truly safe, where they can show up with their whole self and do good work and come home feeling only the normal amount of exhaustion that you feel. <laughs> I think it's just being aware and really trying to keep the conversation going and how do you use it in a positive way. The most important thing is to create a safe place where people can really share their differences and don't feel that they have to conform to a norm. Whatever you want to do, pursue it. If you don't like something, question it. We are immersed in this topic, sometimes not by choice. We know that events like these can impact your lives and have a lasting effect on not only your professional life, but also your personal life. I'm Gretchen, I'm with Girl Geek, welcome. How many of you guys, this is your first event? Yeah, oh wow, that's so many. Okay, so we've been doing these for about 11 years. Um, we've done over 200 of them. We do them almost every week up and down the peninsula, so hopefully you should be on our, wow, oh, that's all right, I can definitely talk over that. Um, we um, do them every week and you should come because you get to see amazing women you get to meet amazing women, and you get to feel inspired so that you can go back and fight the good fight every single day, right? Yes. Okay. So um, we do a podcast also. If you want to check it out, we have we take like little clips from these events, and then we chit-chat around them. Um, so there's like finding a mentor and what's the right way to use the word intersectionality and like all sorts of really important life skill things. So definitely find it, rate it, keep it, and tell us if it's any good, because we've never done a podcast before, so we're still figuring it out. And then finally, we just launched a store on Zazzle with all of our cute little like pixie things. You guys haven't seen a lot of them because they weren't on the branding for this, but it's like super cute. Can I borrow you because I love your hair? Can you hold this for a second? I love her. Okay, so we have this cute like fanny packs and a little bag that you could put cosmetics, but you could also put Sharpies or something less female in, and water bottles, all sorts of stuff. And they have our little Pittsburgh characters. They say, lift as you climb. That's it. We're good. That's all the, that's all the things in my bag. You're an awesome assistant. Everyone give her a hand. All right. So um, this space is awesome. I'm so excited for the content because everything that we've experienced thus far has been really amazing, right? Yes, you ate. You had to have, like, at least. Okay, cool. They're not quite awake yet, but we're going to get them there. I am not a good warm-up for this, apparently. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, please welcome Jennifer Oswald from Clover, who's the head of people operations. Cool. Hi, everyone. I'm going to try and navigate a lot of different technology while I'm up here. I'm Jen Oswald, and uh, it's my pleasure to have you all here um, to kick off our collaboration with Girl Geek X. Uh, this is an event on unconscious bias. So I'd like to thank you for attending, and I can't wait to hear what takeaways you have from this event. We know that events like these can impact your lives and have a lasting effect on not only your professional life, but also your personal life. So our agenda this evening is as follows. 
So first, me, I'm your introduction and welcome. Then we're going to look at uh, what we do. We're proud to showcase a bit on what we do here at Clover. And you'll also be meeting our CEO who will talk you through that. And we'll have lightning talks as well that will show you a little bit more um, about our product. Next, we'll be featuring our panel discussion on unconscious bias. And then lastly, we want to make sure you still have time to network and don't forget your swag. All right, so maybe a silly question. But who was confused by me being up here today introducing unconscious bias? You don't have to raise your hand. You can just think it if you want. So would it surprise you to know that I grew up identifying as two races, Native American and Caucasian? That was before a DNA, DNA test, so more to come about that later. So when biases come to mind, what did you think when you saw my picture before this event? What did you think when I came up here? That is unconscious bias. It's bias happening in our brains, making incredibly quick judgments and assessments of people and situations without us even realizing. So they can be influenced by our background, our cultural environment, and personal experiences, and result in feelings and attitudes towards others based on race, ethnicity, age, appearance, accent, etc. Also termed as implicit social cognition this includes both favorable and unfavorable responses and assessments activated without an individual's awareness or intentional control. So how did I get here? So that's little baby Jen, and that's my mom. As you can probably see, she was a very, very young mom. She had me at a young age. She worked the night shift. And we lived in the projects, AKA subsidized housing. That's a picture of Iowa City, Iowa. We were on food stamps and we struggled to get by. Even at a young age, I knew what it was like to struggle. Then the classic story, mom meets dad. He adopted me at about age six and life was a little more middle class and a little in the, more in the middle of nowhere. I grew up in Palmer, Iowa. This is a picture of our downtown. That is the one gas station. Right next to it was the, uh, the sort of grocery store slash where everybody went to have coffee in the morning. Um, and you know, I was in a town of 256 people. So how diverse do you think that was? So here I am. I'm the only adopted person in the whole town, mixed, left-handed, and female. So how many do you think were college grads? I was supposed to get married, raise three to five kids, maybe have a job after I took care of the kids, and at the very least, I should be a great cook and make sure that everyone is well-fed. So what do I have? I have a college degree, an almost master's, zero kids, except for my fur babies, zero husband, and I just moved from the Silicon Hills, Austin, Texas, to Silicon Valley. My unconscious biases tell me that men should have a career, women should stay home and raise a family. Being adopted, means you don't really have a family like others. Men should make the money. Women should tend to the family. Once poor, always poor. You should write with your right hand because everyone else does. Men are better at math and science. Yet here we are at a tech company with a panel of amazing females to tell you about their experiences and biases they've encountered and how they've proved many of my own unconscious biases wrong. We all have unconscious biases. It comes from our culture, it comes from our families, it comes from our families' families. Yet, once recognized, we can overcome them. 
So here I am, a place I shouldn't even tried to get to, kicking off an event for an amazing company that says, F you, bias. And we're working to overcome and support diversity and inclusion. No matter what the package looks like on the outside, we hire the book, not the cover. So on that note, I want to introduce the person responsible for creating such a great place for like-minded people to come together. In fact, in 2019, he was nominated for two awards, Best CEO for Women and Best CEO for Diversity. And we just think he's the best. So I'd like to welcome John Beatty, our, our Clover CEO. Thanks, Jen. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to Girl Geek X. Uh, you know, I get the opportunity. Of course, I have to promote my own company. There could be no better promotion uh, than Clover than what you just saw with uh, Jen. She's our new head of people, and I think she's absolutely amazing. So uh, it, really excited uh, to grow uh, our people function here. So thank you very much, Jen. All right, so uh, first I'm going to just tell you a little bit about what we do here. Uh, so uh, you've probably encountered a device that looks very much like this. Uh, <clears throat> we are uh, all across America. We're all also in uh, a number of other countries. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we build absolutely beautiful cloud-based point-of-sale uh, hardware and software and, and systems. Uh, I'll tell you the, the reason why we did this, this was you know, going back, we started Clover about eight years ago. And what we saw was a bunch of really ugly, really insecure, really closed uh, systems. Uh, and there was, you know, on the counter at all these uh, restaurants and retailers and services companies. And we were trying to bring some innovations uh, into that market and just ran into uh, a bunch of brick walls. And we started talking to business owners, and we realized they absolutely hate their systems. They keep having data breaches. Uh, the systems really don't help them uh, run or grow their businesses uh, very efficiently. Uh, so we thought that was a very interesting problem to solve. Uh, we, love the, we love small businesses. We love and recognize that uh, a lot of small business owners are just trying to do what they love, and they, they need uh, technology uh, to support them. So uh, we have many, many, uh, we've manufactured over a million devices. Uh, US, the U.S. is our largest market, so you have almost certainly uh, encountered one of our uh, devices. Uh, so uh, on the consumer side, uh, we have a very engaging uh, consumer experience. Uh, first, the, the consumer journey starts off typically signing up for a loyalty program. You've probably seen one of these as well. You just type in your phone number. Uh, and then we extend that consumer journey. If we could go to the next slide. All the way to the mobile phone. We have a very highly rated mobile app as well. Uh, it starts off with loyalty. But of course, you know, we also have Bluetooth uh, beacon enabled payments. You can walk into a store. You don't even take it out of your pocket. They know you're there. They know what you like. Uh, you don't even have to, uh, to pay. They, you just say, I, I'd like to pay with Clover, and you walk out. It's a, it's a very magical experience. On the other side of the counter, uh, they have a Clover device. Your, your profile picture will show up there, a little bit about your history, how, how often you've been there, and what you like. Uh, and so we're really building a, a, an absolutely fantastic end-to-end -end experience, both, both for the merchant and the, and the consumer. Uh, now, we also have... Uh, an app marketplace uh, that helps businesses run and grow their businesses. Uh, there, we take we take a lot of the we make a lot of the mundane very simple. So we have a number of partners in in, in categories like payroll. Uh, if you want to uh, make your life very easy as a business owner and get all the employee information and get it into your payroll system, we make that very seamless. We work with best of breed uh, other companies. Uh, uh, and, and we partner with many of them here in the app market. So, all right, that is enough about uh, a Clover. Uh, so I, I know I get a, a few minutes here of corporate shelling, so thanks for bearing with me. Uh, so uh, first, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, what does it take to win um, one of these uh, awards? So let me just tell you, when I first uh, uh, you know, saw the news uh, that I uh, won these um, awards, I had sort of two thoughts. Uh, the first is, well, that's really cool. I, I'm very proud of that. And then the second is like, how did that happen, uh, uh, to, to be completely honest? And so first, to talk just a little bit about the uh, sort of the, the, the pride that I felt. So, so th these meant a, it meant a lot to me. So, you know, both personally and professionally. Uh, personally, you know, I have a, uh, I have a, a, a wife uh, who, my wife is right here in the front row. Uh, she's a scientist she's, uh, uh, who's now in business development. 
uh, very accomplished uh, in, her, uh, in her field. I also have a, 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 a six-year-old daughter, and I also have uh, two boys, uh, uh, four and two. And uh, I'm not going to go into any details. You know, my, let's say my wife has run into some professional situations that are absolutely outrageously unacceptable. I think the world has made a tremendous amount of progress in being more fair and just over the last 50 years, but there's a lot of uh, work uh, left to do. Uh, and with, my, with all of my kids, both my, both my girl and my boys, uh, I'm very, like, when they grow up and they see that I've done things like this, like, I I'm very proud that, that I can say I help make the world uh, more fair uh, and just, and that means a lot to me um, um, personally. Now, uh, it, I asked the question, like, what does it take to win one of those rewards? Honestly, the answer is not enough, right? The bar is actually just too low. I will say we try very hard uh, at, at Clover on diversity uh, and inclusion, but we are a small uh, uh, company, right? Just a short number of years ago, we were a very small startup just sur trying to uh, survive. Most of your thoughts on how do I not die, not how do I create the world's best culture. Now, now that we've uh, grown up a little bit, now we are very focused on building out those programs. We're out of the almost dying category and into the very successful category. So I'm very proud uh, that we're uh, doing events like this uh, uh, tonight. Uh, but, you know, this, th this is very recent for us to actually build these institutions. And, you know, we have a women in tech uh, uh, group uh, here at Clover. Uh, and that's a very grassroots effort. And it's, it's building and it's building. And, and we're really getting a lot of great programs here. So uh, that w I could win this award with honestly not doing that much proactively, just avoiding the unforced errors and making sure we squash any bad behavior that we see uh, means the bar is probably uh, too low. So, uh, so that's the Clover story. If you could... Uh, just jump, of course, I'm going to show one more time. Uh, we have recruiters standing by. Uh, <laughs> Alicia, John, they are waving at you right there. They would love to talk to you. Uh, and of course, uh, Clever.com uh, careers. So, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Rachel. Rachel, why don't you come on up? Rachel is on our software engineering team on our payment terminal API, and she will tell you a little bit more about what she does in Lightning Talk. Hi, my name is Rachel Antion, and I'm a software engineer here at Clover on the semi-integrations team, which is kind of our internal name for the payment terminal API, so if I use them interchangeably, that's why. Okay. So overall, we make about 2 billion car transactions every year, which amounts to be about $100 billion on over a million devices sold in seven countries, and we are approaching 5% of Visa and MasterCard volume worldwide, which I think is pretty impressive considering we're only in seven countries right now. And of that, 2.5% of those transactions are processed via the payment terminal API, which might not sound like a lot until you think that it's about $2.5 billion, and it's growing every year. Can you click it? <laughs> And some of those transactions are coming from integrators that you probably recognize, like Amazon, the Las Vegas Convention Center, the stadiums of the Philadelphia Eagles, the Seattle Seahawks, and the New York Mets. All of these integrators created their own solution customized to their individual business needs. Here is a specific example of a solution built with the Payments Terminal API. This is a beautiful point of sale created by Hy-Vee that's totally customized to their individual business needs. But in order to appreciate just how awesome this is, you might need to know a little bit more about the Payment Terminal API, where it came from, and how it works. So people have been taking payments for pretty much as long as people have been around. And as we progress, the way that we take payments also has to progress. When credit cards were first introduced, there was not a lot of security. But as the age of the internet progressed, so did the need for that security. Older point of sales basically consisted of some kind of UI attached to a Mac Stripe reader that would send unencrypted data to the point of sale, which might make all of you uncomfortable because it led to things like the data breaches that started in 2010. Clover knew that there had to be a better way to take secured payments without making companies throw away all the hard work they put into developing their point of sale systems. 
And that solution was the Payments Terminal API, which allows you to use the Clover device as an external payment device. Your point of sale gets a Clover Payments API, and Clover provides the PCI compliance. Basically, you make the point of sale, and Clover takes right care of the rest. All the point of sale needs to worry about is creating the order and making sure the right amount gets sent to the Clover device. So we have two different flavors, if you will, of the Payments Terminal API. We have native or a takeover that lets you create your own app that runs directly on the Clover device. And we have remote that lets you run it on pretty much any device. We have SDKs in Android, iOS, Windows, and JavaScript. So the possibilities are pretty endless. That beautiful point of sale I showed you earlier is actually an example of a takeover model. You can see it here running on our Clover station. So who exactly is the payment terminal API for? It's for someone who has an existing point of sale. Maybe everybody's already trained, they know how to use it, and it works just fine, but they want to use the Clover device to take payments because it's faster. It's someone with a specific business case, a hotel, a restaurant, a mom and pop shop, they're all gonna have different payment needs, and it makes sense that they might want different apps. It's for someone who wants more control over the process. It's possible that you need different payment flows even within the same business. For example, at a salon, how you pay for a service and just a product might be different. You probably don't need a tip and signature if you're just buying a bottle of shampoo, but you do when you're buying your snazzy new haircut. <laughs> or it's someone who just wants to build their own app. And if you think this might be you, or you have any other questions, I'd be happy to chat with you after. And now I'm going to turn this over to Wako, who's going to talk to you about empathy here at Clover. Hi, everyone. My name is Wako Takayama, and I lead the user research group here at Clover. Uh, John and Rachel introduced you to our product and the technology, so I am going to focus on the people who use our products and services here. Uh, business owners like Thomas, who runs Poor Boy's Cajun Kitchen, which is just a few miles from here. You may have been there. Very good food. And Olivia from Theory Salon, which is in Woodstock. Georgia. So as with a lot of companies, we at Clover, we face the challenge that we build products for people who do jobs that we don't do. You know, these small business owners, they, like Thomas and uh, Olivia, they have a lot of things on their plate. They're juggling a lot of things. They make all the decisions about their business. Where are they going to open their store? What's their product? What what's the price they're going to sell things at, they have to hire, they have to fire. Um, here we have a, one of our local uh, businessmen. He needs to set up his own Clover system. He takes orders. He delivers food. He's checking inventory. And then, you know, he has to call the vendor to make sure that he has stuff to sell. So a lot of stuff. This is just what we call front of house. And then there's back of house. It's all the office management stuff. Lots of stuff that these business owners have to do. So for us to do our jobs as designers, engineers, marketers, we really need to know a lot about what these people do. We need to know that because that's what we base our work on, so building the designing that we do. The user research team, my colleagues and I, we help by doing formal research studies. And we work on fostering company empathy across the whole company. And, but first, what is empathy? Okay, I'm going to read this to you. The ability to step into the shoes of another person, aiming to understand their feelings and perspectives and to use that understanding to guide our actions. So the key here is that empathy allows us to get beyond our biases. 
So one way we're doing this, I'll tell you quickly, is that we foster empathy at Clover starting on day one at the company. So if you were to join Clover, you join the Merchant Empathy Program. And this is a way to step into the shoes of, new, of a new Clover merchant. So during the first week, you would work with your fellow new hires to dream up a business, set up a Clover system. You can see one of our designers really went over the top, and he created this beautiful menu. And then take orders and payments. So I'm a researcher, so of course I send out surveys after things. Um, so I found out that this program has had a really great impact. One engineer said, there were a couple of issues I worked on as I joined the team, and due to my knowledge of the system, from the session I was able to figure out a couple of issues easily. That's fantastic, right? And another engineer said, uh, it has helped me feel more connected to the customer and the company, and has helped me uh, feel a little closer to the customer. So that's really the key. We want, you know, we want to all feel closer to the customer, that we understand them, that we are serving them. So imagine what stepping into the shoes of the user of your product or service could look like. You know, how can you foster empathy for the person who's using the product that you're working so hard to build? Um, if you'd like to brainstorm with, uh, if you'd like me to brainstorm with you about some ideas, I'd be happy to do that. Just come find me afterward. And if you haven't already had a chance to touch and uh, step into the shoes of our Clover merchants, you can do that over there um, to get your swag and also just to you know play around with our product. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Kudrun too. Thank you, Wako. Well, let me see if I can make this magical work somehow. Let me give it a try. Nope, doesn't like me. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Kujing Shu. I'm a product design manager here in Clover. And I want to talk about how we fall at Clover today. And um, you don't have to be a designer to think design. So you may ask, well, next, please. What is design thinking? Um, oh, actually, first of all, let me start uh, with some numbers. It's quite interesting. Um, a few years ago, a team of researchers looked at how design impacted the organizations across the S&P 500 companies. And what they found was that of the top 20 companies, including Apple and Coca-Cola, who made it to a list who are considered as design-centric, their stocks performed 211% over S&P 500 index. This is compelling data. Well, so you may ask, well, what is design thinking? Fortunately, we didn't invent the term. You can search tons of information and technology out there. Um, but basically, it's a framework to foster innovation and collaboration. It starts from empathizing with your target audiences all the way to testing and evaluation. Wako talk a lot about merchant empathy. A lot of us joined at Clover without any knowledge about restaurants or SMBs, including myself. So we would go out for day trips and we go talk to the restaurant owners and managers. We'll learn about their lives and their challenges. We also would go and shadow them and see how they would bring, bring up an order on the Clover station or how they would take an order, take a payment. Oh, it works. Can I have it? I'll try it. Or um, this is a trip that my product manager, my researcher, and I went out and shadow the merchants and see how they would take uh, payments at the table. Still didn't like me. Oh, So sometimes when things are disconnected, we'll go on and talk to them and see how much the pain point was. There are also other insights and data that we just couldn't get by sitting here at our cubicles or in the office. By looking at this sheet of paper, the restaurant owner would know exactly what's going on with this, with this restaurant. It's actually a pizza restaurant out there in Sunnyvale called uh, Tasty Pizza. The owner would know exactly what r their customers ordered, where's the order coming from, is it Uber Eats or is it from DoorDash, was it paid or not? 
So with all that full of data, I'm going to just do it myself, we'll come back to the office and sit down as a team and really scope the problem. And I'm, proud to re I'm really proud to say that every sticky note out there that you see our team put up, it connects to a real world problem. And then we'll also we'll sit down as a team to sketch the ideas all together. Like I said, you don't have to be a designer in order to design. And one of the sketches that got the most a dotted vote on is actually from one of our engineers. And this is where the design team will come into play. We would turn the ideas and all the concepts and sketches into clickable prototypes. And we would then present the prototypes and we'll do usability testing around it. Some of the testing that we've done are in-house. We will invite merchants to our office and give them a tour and in the meantime, help us usability test our prototype. Some, sometimes we'll go back to the restaurant and we'll go back and talk to them and test the prototype in their natural environment. And a lot of times we also do our usability testing remotely in remote sessions through GoToMeeting or Google Meet because we know that we live in this place called a bubble, a Silicon Valley. Well, design apparently doesn't stop here. We shepherd through the entire development process. But what, what this really enables us is that design get to sit at the forefront of the conversation and everyone get to sit at the forefront of the conversation. It allows product managers, engineers, marketers, researchers, designers, and everyone on the team and cross-functionally align our goals. And that's a recipe for high-performing teams. And then you have to add a very special flavor to how we make design here and Clover. It's really that we make this a fun process to work on. And if you haven't noticed, we have an open bar at that corner. What's more fun than sipping on a glass of mimosa than sketching your next product idea? Thank you. And next up, I want to introduce our lovely panel for tonight with the topic of navigating conscious and unconscious bias. And I want to introduce our uh, moderator for tonight, our engineering director, Bao Chao Wen. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bao Chao Nguyen, and I lead several engineering teams here at Clover, the Clover mobile apps point of sale and the app market um, web apps. The topic of conscious and unconscious bias had never been more prevalent than right now. From the current political landscape to the social movements, we are immersed in this topic. And it's a sometimes not by choice. We've come a long way in identifying biases, but we're not close to you know, eliminating or overcoming them consistently. So I want to show you a research study that I ran across on this topic. Imagine a fake company having a 1% performance bias towards gender. The impact of this 1%, they're starting out with 50-50 men-women distribution across all career levels. And this company rates women from 1 to 100 and men from 1 to 101. Over 20 simulations, the company is now skewed with fewer women at top levels. Now imagine running more simulations, the number is gonna be a bigger gap. We know this is a fake company, but we also know 1% bias is not realistic. Having been a young immigrant to America, I faced many biases over the years in all aspects, from classrooms to just vacationing outside of California to you know, workplaces. And I wanted to make sure that tonight's panel will have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with you. And whether you have experienced a bias or not, you can walk away with more awareness and some learnings on how we can become allies to one another. And you want to speak up when you see these microaggressions and stand up for each other, because together we are stronger. With that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. 
Mary Eastlander, Ellen, Ellen Lenardi, Rachel Ramsey, and Meghna Randat. So let's start, ladies. Welcome. Uh, would you uh, talk a little bit about your role here and what was your initial reaction when you were invited on this talk? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Eastlander. I'm actually from our New York office, uh, and I lead commercialization, client experience, uh, and work closely with the Clover team. I'm actually part of Pfizer, the parent company. Um, for me, the idea, the, the, the topic was really around inclusivity and how you use it to an advantage to really build uh, uh, diverse teams uh, for success. So I'm really excited to talk more about that. Right. Hi, uh, Ellen Lenardi, uh, head the product team here at Clover. Um, so when Bao Chao approached me about, you know, kind of being in the panel, um, it was it was interesting. I think I've always had a very interesting relationship with bias, both having um, seen a lot of it, and we'll chat more about that a little bit later, but also how it made me feel, then how I reacted to it, and how I find what you do with the bias that is ultimately always going to be there leads a lot to the outcome. So hopefully we get to chat a little bit about that, and we find it valuable, and excited to be here. Hi, um, my name is Rachel Ramsey. I'm a developer advocate here at Clover. I also work very closely with our data analytics team. Um, when you invited me to be on this panel, I was excited because um, up until I was uh, 25, I thought I was going to be a sociologist. Um, so I feel that I bring a more structural perspective than a lot of people have. Hi, I'm Megan Aranda, and I am a software engineer on the payments team here. Um, when I was first invited to talk about this topic by Bao Chao, I was uh, really excited and very happy because this is one of the topics which is very close to my heart. I have always been an advocate uh, for women against inequality, against bias, and a lot of things we are going to talk here. And just coming from a very different background of being an immigrant and a woman and uh, just an engineer, so I face it every day. So thank you for having me. Honored to be here. Great. We're going to start. Um, this is the question for all of you. Uh, would you share a time or a setting where you experienced a gender or an affiliation bias? How, how did that make you feel? And how did you overcome that? I can start with you. Um, when I was growing up, uh, the part of the world that I grew up in, in India, um, it was a norm, and it was also kind of uh, common that women should get a college degree uh, to find a better husband, not to find a better job, and then run the home. So people would often ask me, why do you want to work so hard? Why do you want to have a career when all you can do is like support your husband, be home, so he can really focus on his work? very fundamental assumption that women cannot, are not really so capable to work outside home and can have a career was very upsetting. And I had to overcome that uh, many times in my life. To me, uh, the key really is to believe in yourself. Sometimes, you know, you have to do what you have to do if you want to get something, if you have a goal that you need to achieve. You have to be persistent. And uh, sometimes it could mean challenging the status quo. I was the first women engineer in my family and the first one to travel abroad, come to a new country all alone to pursue my career. So it's, it's very easy when you have a defined path. But it, it's really hard when you know where you want to be, but nobody to guide you or mentor you. So really, all you can do is to believe in yourself. I really can relate to that. My parents came here and had to start their career all over. They were teachers, and then they came here, and they had to go to back to school for a different degree and different occupations. So I applaud you, Meghna. Rachel. Yeah. Um, so I'm an older millennial. Um, <laughs> and uh, no. 
I say that because I feel like a lot of women my age, when we were in middle school, when we were in high school, we were learning HTML, we were learning CSS, we were learning JavaScript, because we were making our own websites back in the web 1.0 days. Um, yet of all my friends and I who did that, no one was like, that's front-end web design. You can make a lot of money doing that. Or no one else was like, there are other programming languages that you might enjoy. Um, so n out of my friends, none of us ended up pursuing it in college or as a career. I sort of backed into tech by going to a boot camp. Um, but even once you get your foot in the door, like once you're the diversity in DNI, um, it can be hard to stay technical because people say, uh, you have such great people skills, maybe you want to go into management, or you're a great communicator. Have you thought about technical writing? Um, so it can be very hard to say, my North Star is whatever it is for you. You know, I want to be a principal engineer, and staying on that, staying technical, working with your manager to say, I want to get the promotion, what do I have to do, where are the opportunities? So you really do have to run your own career sometimes. All right, so I think from my perspective, you know, a lot of the stuff that Meghna and Rachel both talked about are certainly true. Um, I grew up in Indonesia in a town not very different than what Jen showed. We had seven, about 7-Eleven looking thing. And, <laughs> and if I get in trouble at school, by the time I get home, my mom knows about it. I don't know how, but it's a very small town. So, you know, similar expectation with what Meghna was saying, you know, grow up, get married, make sure the man takes care of you. But, um, you know, I think, while, while I have a lot of stories, I think, on, on biases that I've seen, what I wanted to share was um, probably an experience I had early in my career when I was at Intuit. So I started out as an engineer there and, you know, love coding. I was a keyboard hogger. Uh, <laughs> kind of, when someone's coding or trying to solve a problem too long, I get anxious. I was like, let me try, let me try. But um, <laughs> I, knew, I knew I was very comfortable. I enjoyed that a lot. And um, the other thing that was quite interesting, and I think this is something a lot of female can identify with, I was a good communicator. I like to organize. I um, paid a lot of attention on how everybody else feels. So I kind of try to make it a team decision, make sure everyone's included. So one day, one of my colleagues came to me and um, told me, he's like, you know, you're an okay developer, but you know it's all because you're a good talker, right? And I think it was meant as a dig. And I think the things that I really wanted to share here is at that point you have a decision, right? You could take it as a dig or you could take it as a compliment. So I chose to take it as a compliment at the time. And you know I said thank you very much. It is a skill. So if you ever need help, I'll be happy to help you in that area. Right? So, <laughs> so I think the, the thing I wanted to kind of share there is that, you know, we are all going to run into bias, especially unconscious bias, and it's called unconscious for that reason. It is going to be there, and I think we're going to have a lot of opportunity to decide what you do with it, right? You either let it drive you and change the decision you have or, you know, to the point of focusing on where you want to go, take it how you want it, and the bias folks have are not always bad. If someone say you're Asian, you must be good in math. Maybe you are. You're like, yes, I am. Thank you. Right? So, so I just think that one of the way that I've sort of approached some of the biases is not always negative. It's simply a perception people have had going into that interaction with you and their experience of how they thought you should be. So. Did you uh, remember some of the uh, responses after you know you, your? You know, I never heard that line again after that. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you. Certainly being a good communicator has got me to where I am and it hasn't held me back. So I suggest that if you guys felt biases or people saying things that, you know, you're female, you must be good in this, say thank you. That's awesome. I'm good in that and this, right? So um, I wanted to share more. First of all, having conversations like this is critically important and I'm I'm just thrilled that everybody's here and I think this is a conversation that we have to keep having, right? So from my perspective, um, what I try to do is constantly, you know, make people aware that maybe they're thinking about things a certain way because of some unconscious bias. And whether it's working with my male colleagues, if, you know, we're in the middle of, of merging with a new company and, you know, people are making their, you know, decisions or judgments about individuals. And it's always interesting about how they talk about the women versus how they talk about the men. And when there's senior women who are very strong and very powerful and very opinionated and very inquisitive and are asking hard questions, there's always a different value judgment on that individual 
versus if John was sitting down and really asking all those hard questions, why did you think about it this way, why are you doing that, that's part of what you do. And so it, it's really important to, and in a, you know, in, in a right way, but just say, you know, did you think about, like, are you, are you judging this person differently because they are a woman or, and so it, it's really being aware of that and, and personally I try very hard within my own team and I can see it as well. I have two young analysts, there's a, a, a male and a female and they're both incredibly smart and very talented. She works her butt off and puts her head down and, you know, quietly and just gets things done. You know, and the young gentleman, I mean, he's great too, but he's constantly putting time on the calendar and just showing me what he's done. And so, in, in, and not in a bad way, and, but I encourage her, you know, to do the same. So I think it's just being aware of each other as well and really trying to keep the conversation going and how do you use it in a positive way. Thank you, Mary. Just hold on to that. Um, I wanted to ask you a follow-up question. So having so much uh, experience and leading big teams, in your, um, what have you noticed in your observations uh, on diversity and how it I impacts business outcomes? So I, I would say it, it's really important to have different people on your team that do different things, but also come to uh, with a different perspective, right? So you want someone, you know, that like Kajan would, who'd have a design perspective, right? Somebody who's going to have a different perspective on, you know, let's say the merchant or empathy, analytical skills, detail oriented, big picture, creative. But it's really the power of that diversity of thought that really helps you get better outcomes, but what you also want to have is the commonality of you want people to have similar core values, right, to be ethical, to be honest, to work hard, to be smart and talented. So you really want to, you want to build your team based on skills and based on talent, but you want that talent to have a very diverse perspective, and that really helps you, you know, achieve much better goals because people are challenging you in different ways and arriving in problem solving in unique ways to get a much better result. Oh, thank you. I love that. Um, Ellen, going back to what you were saying coming from Indo Indonesia and having that cultural bias of, of certain things that women have to do, um, and I know you have two daughters, right? Are I'm they here? around here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> They're just being great kids. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Knowing that cultural bias exists and having daughters, do you ha does that impact how you raise them? Um, I, think, I think what actually impacts how I raise my kids has a lot to do with how I was raised, actually, right? And so uh, the interesting thing is while I grew up in a very like traditional Asian town, um, I would say my parents were probably pretty progressive, not very uh, conventional. Partly, my sister and I always, so um, I have t one sibling, so we are two sisters as well. So my dad never had a son, right? And so I think he poured it all into us. So he basically told us, whatever you want to do, pursue it. If you don't like something, question it. And I think it drove my mother crazy somehow because when she told us, you know, because I told you so, we're like, that's not a reason. Right? So, <laughs> so I think we, we were brought up to really question the assumption, right? And I think that was unusual. And I think that was unusual in my town. That might be unusual for some of you. But I think questioning the bias and assumption and take it as an opinion at face value and then deciding for yourself, it's really a matter of choice, right? Running a home is not a bad choice, right? And I think that's kind of one of the tricky things is that a lot of times you could see your, your, your mom's giving you the value she knew and she knew how to run a home and she, that's the life she could envision for you. And so to be able to understand the intent behind it and realize the impact that it has, but not take it as face value and be able to insert kind of your own thoughts and your own desire to it. Um, and I think that is sort of what I was taught. So for me, I told my parents all the time, I'm like I, I grew up to become who I am because of what um, I think the upbringing that I had. And I tried to do the same with my kids. I hope to be half as good of a parent as my parents was. So, uh, but, you know, it's the same thing. And I think part of it is that it's, it's slightly uncomfortable. You tell them to question things. I tell them because mommy told you so. And before I say it, I'm like, they're going to tell me it's not a reason. But it's, it's ensuring that 
you know, you understand why you're doing things and it is for a reason that you accept and you're aligned with. It's not because someone told you, it's not because you're scared, it's not because society expects you to do so, it's because you want to, right? So I think that sort of kind of having that as a compass is what I try to instill in my kids. So um, yeah, so that's helped me, hopefully it helps others as well. Certainly, uh, I grew up and my mom expected me to help her in the kitchen and I always ran off and you know go, go do something else. Um, and having two kids, a boy and a girl, I try to be as equal. Um, whether by chores is like both of you clean up your rooms, both of you fold away the, your own laundry, both of you wash your own dishes. So not guiding them towards anything that is specific to their gender that they have to do. Um, and yeah, just growing up here and seeing that world it really helped me. Uh, raise my kids too. It was actually one of the interesting thing when I first came to the States and I came after high school actually and um, was I always thought I was different when I was back home but my parents kept telling me it was okay to be different. I was also a sick kid so there was a lot of reason to be different but when I came here I realized I was different but everyone felt a lot more different and being different was okay. I'm like, that's awesome. I'm never going back. <laughs> so here I am like 20, later, 20 years later. <laughs> so Rachel, um, ha being a lesbian, you have twice the potential for bias from gender to sexual orientation. What changes or suggestions uh, would you like to see in an organization to combat these biases? Well, uh, it's easier to be a lesbian in the Bay Area than it was in North Carolina. <laughs> um, and I do want to call out the ways in which I am privileged, which allowed me to come here. Um, Right, so I'm a white woman, I come from an um, upper middle class background, I'm a cis woman. Um, when I decided like, oh, the Bay Area is really expensive, I need to get one of those tech jobs, I was able to say, you know, um, I can get a loan to go to the, the boot camp, but dad, I'd like, I'm gonna be out of work for three months, like, can you give me a loan from the bank of dad? Which he did. Um, so, thank the question you is. Us. <laughs> thank you, your dad, for us. Yes, I will tell, I'll tell him that, but, um, right, so how do we create a, a world where everyone is safe is a really big question, bigger than the question you asked me, so I will limit myself. Um, but I'm really excited uh, by what Jen is planning, our new head of people ops, um, to include um, more of a diversity and inclusion training as part of our onboarding, sort of similar uh, to the program that we established for merchant empathy. Um, but you know, it's not just about new hires, it's across the company. Um, every year I get to sit through some trainings that are like, don't bribe people, <laughs> don't sexually harass people. I would love to also have a mandatory training, like don't misgender your colleagues. Um, so it's not just about education, it's also you know, the, the policies and the material support that we can provide to our colleagues. Um, so whether that's little simple steps like normalizing, doing your pronouns when you get introduced, um, whether that's, you know, having a gender neutral bathroom so that's just like a place for non-binary folks, um, and of course, making trans healthcare accessible. It has to be part of your health coverage and you also have to pair it with a supportive medical leave policy. Hear that, Jen? <laughs> She's working on it. Um, Meghna, um, you have two little kids, and describe to me balancing work and life, and not having the choices to stay late to work on a project, or going out to a team dinner for team bonding. How did that impact you, or how do you feel like it impacted you or your career? Yeah, I think, you know, most of us feel that 24 hours in a day is not enough. I feel when you have young kids, even 48 hours are not enough. <laughs> it's just a lot, uh, physically, emotionally, sleepless, sleepless nights, and being present at work, and to be productive at what you do. So when my team goes out for happy hours, right, and happy hours, I feel, or staying working late together as a team, are ways to bond, are ways to network, 
sometimes you talk about things which are not related to work. Um, you talk about your passions. We are in this space together, and we are like all motivated towards similar goals. So you form like a sense of community. You feel you belong here. <clears throat> and I, I felt when that happens, the team that I worked in was much more productive. So uh, when being a young mom, right? Being a young mom is incredibly hard. It's, it's very hard to create that harmonious balance between work and family. So I do have to put definitely much more effort uh, for working or even sometimes to just bond with my colleagues. Um, for example, you know, there has been times I had a four-year-old boy, a five-month-old baby, I'm on call for production, there's a fire, and I have to deal with it. I have to debug the issue. So my sick kid is not refusing to eat, so I'm like kind of sitting him at the table, trying to get him to eat, a laptop in front of me, slacking and trying to look at all the graphs and debugging our code to figure out what's wrong, to make sure we don't fall apart as Clover, and at the same time, holding my five-month-old in another hand and breastfeeding her when she's like happily wow. sucking away. <laughs> so it's That's multitasking to the next level. And all moms have it. It's not just me. <laughs> so, um, but I feel very grateful. I have an incredible partner who um, supports me when you have to you know, stay at, late at work. For example, today, he's babysitting. <laughs> and um, I feel equally you know, happy to work for a company which supports its employees through various life phases. It's just not like flexible hours or maternity perks. It's more than that. It's the, it's the thinking that's ingrained in culture here at Clover. So um, in my first week, actually, uh, we had a happy hour on a Thursday, and John Beery, our CEO, he came up to me and you know, he told me, hey, I know you've been a new mom, and I know how hard it can be because I'm a new parent myself. And uh, I understand um, it's hard, and I'm here to support you. So let me know if you need anything. That itself kind of is, that comes back to me every time I feel I'm struggling. And it's very reassuring to have that support, just not at home, but also at work. So I, I feel happy and cared for. Wow, that's a great story. Thank you, John. <laughs> Um, one last question before we open up to Q&A um, for everyone. Um, how would you challenge stereotypes, uh, provide some advice to our audience, and promote sensitivity and inclusion? Anyone? Um, so as Jen said, right, we all have unconscious bias. We have amazing unconscious mind, which helps us navigate through a lot of decisions that we make every day. But unfortunately, this unconscious bias that we have against people could lead to make some you know, wrong assumptions about people. So every time um, I make assumptions about someone, I try to ask myself, why? Why have I made that? You know, why do I think that way? Do I have enough data to support that? You know, has that person, does, it, does he have skills to do what he needs to do or she needs to do? Um, so for me, to challenge stereotypes, the key is to you know, keep asking yourself and be really mindful and be conscious about your biases. So once you're aware, I think that's kind of the very first step towards tackling those. And uh, to create a very diverse and inclusive environment, uh, it's very important to have a diverse team because most people learn from their experiences. To me, personally, experiences are most powerful. That's how I learn. So when you create those diverse teams, it can be gender, it can be number of experience, your background, many other things, right? Then people, uh, when they interact with each other, they, their assumptions are challenged a lot of times and they understand perspective of other people. So that helps you know, improve the whole culture of inclusion. 
And uh, I feel when you're creating such diverse teams in workplace, it's the most important thing is to create a safe place where people can really share their differences and don't feel that they have to conform to a norm. So really getting that richness in workplace would be kind of the key, I guess. Well said. Rachel? Um, so I think you know, getting people in the door is not enough. Um, hiring is not enough. You have to be bringing them into an environment that is truly inclusive, truly safe, where they can uh, you know, show up with their whole self and do good work and come home feeling only the normal amount of exhaustion that you feel. <laughs> um, so how do you do that? I do think it requires C-suite level buy-in. It requires a buy-in from managers. Um, I'm not a manager. I'm an individual contributor. So as a, an, an, an IC, um, one thing that we can do for each other is we can look out for each other. We can have each other's backs. Um, you know, one time I was in a meeting, and whenever I noticed, like, hmm, who gets cut off, uh, who gets assigned the sort of note-taking, who gets chosen. You know, so you don't want a white knight for people because, you know, it's their career, right? But it's easy to stand up for someone else, probably easier than standing up for yourself. So there's always an opportunity to call in a coworker, to call in a manager. Yeah. So let's see, um, where do we start here? <laughs> I think that ultimately, the interesting thing for, for me, at least from my experience on unconscious bias, is that we, we all have it, right? And so in some ways, I say we have unconscious bias to the people that we think have unconscious bias. <laughs> right? like when certain people approach you in a particular way, you react to them. And, you know, like one of my biggest learning, I think, over the years, professionally and personally, really, right? So I'm, I'm a divorced mom as well. So I've, I've gone through various kind of like life experiences as well in that area is, is to decouple the impact and the intent, right? Like the minute you couple the two because of the way someone makes you feel and you start reacting to that personally, emotionally, right? The conversation really isn't going to go anywhere, right? And so the, the, the biggest thing that I really try to do is I'm like, Take the impact, it's like, ouch, that hurts, right? And then decouple it and say, I know you didn't mean to do that because, you know, when you say out the intent, it sounds completely bad. And then even if they mean to do it, they'll be like, no, no, that was not what I meant to do. Right? And then take the, everyone take the higher road, but give people a chance to take the higher road, right? Because when you tell someone, I know you're bad, they'll be bad. But when you say, I know you're actually good, but what you did was bad, it gives them a chance to make different choices. So I think that's the first thing, is that you know, be aware of how you're reacting to the unconscious bias. If you react to the unconscious bias by providing your own unconscious bias, it's sort of like regurgitating the same cycle and doesn't really get anywhere. Right? And I think the second thing is when it comes down to bias, the best thing I've ever found throughout my career of changing that is by changing the experience that the individual, the people who are grouped in front of you have with whoever you represent, right? And sometimes I represent like an epileptic person. Sometimes I represent a divorced mom. Sometimes I'm an immigrant. Sometimes I'm a female leader, right? But in whatever context, you have an opportunity to recreate what it meant to interact with who you represent, right? And when you change that experience, that changed perception, that changed bias, because it is very hard to tell someone, change your unconscious bias, it starts from the experience because that's where it comes from. So I think we all have an opportunity to slowly change that up by, you know, both by, I think, you know, s um, providing programs, having structures and policies and everything that encourages it and making sure people are more aware. But each of us individually also have a chance, I think, on every interaction to not, I think, not continue that bias cycle and try to break it as well. So. Yeah, I think we can all be allies. We can always find something that we can be ally for each other. Yeah. yeah, so a couple of things. One I try, and it's very hard to do, is listen more. So, so much with unconscious bias, your brain is going, you're looking at someone, you're making a snap judgment. But then if you stop and you actually listen to what they're saying, it's overwhelming. Like, oh my God, this person's amazing. And what they're saying is incredible. So I think for all of us to just stop and really listen, hear, 
um, and just try to incorporate just that skill into everything you do. That would be one thing I, I, I work on every day. I think the other is if you're either managing people, be aware of try of always going to the same person. And it, it's easier said than done because of, you know, a lot of times you have deadlines and you need to get things done and, you know, Ellen is the one who can always deliver like that or whomever, but you have to really give other people a chance and also coach and help them, right? And, and, and mentoring is another thing we haven't talked about as much here, but we all know how important mentoring is. And mentoring is everywhere. It's tonight, right? It's listening to these amazing women and hearing about John and others. You look around you, right? Every day you should look forward and see what could I take from someone, whether it's the person at the front desk or whether it's, you know, the person who's bringing the coffee. Like there's always something to learn. And then if there's someone who you really admire or respect and you want to spend some time with them, seek them out. Ask them if they'd be willing to have a cup of coffee with you, right? So it's just, it's listening, it's being aware, it's trying to spread, you know, the love around um, and really help each other out. Like we as women here have to really continue to help each other and help the men, right? Because sometimes they need a little help and understanding probably more so than most, but I think it's our job and, and responsibility to, to keep doing and keep advocating. Uh, and I know that you are part of many women organizations as well, right? You're a big advocate for women. Can you yeah. talk a little yeah, bit about I'll talk that? about, uh, so WNET is another women's organization. Girl Geek X is amazing, but WNET um, is a women, it's another organization for women in the payment uh, industry. Uh, Audrey Blackman is in the back and she's uh, one of my fellow board members at WNET, and we really try to do all kinds of advocacy, education, training, webinars. So I encourage you to take a look at WNET.org uh, if you're interested in joining. Um, what we're going to do is more, we'll probably do an event here as well, but any women's organization or, you know, have a, a lunch and learn in your company, right? Get people together, have conversations. And I think that's that's really what we are trying to do here. And uh, I just personally want to say, about Chow and all of you, thank you. You know, I feel like I'm an honorary Clover member because I'm I'm part of the other side of the company. But Aww. I am so honored uh, personally just to be here and to be part of this amazing group. So thank you for having me. At this time, we wrap up the uh, panel questionnaire and open up for Q and A. Thank you. I actually thought of not using maybe a microphone because it was too far away, but thank you for this. Uh, my name is Natalia, and thank you for sharing all the stories and feedback. Uh, unfortunately, unconscious bias is something that affects many people, um, whoever brings any kind of diversity. And I'm really curious about the feedback that you might actually hear from male colleagues, maybe your partners, maybe your husbands, maybe your brothers or fathers, uh, do they also see that unconscious bias impact them? And most importantly, how they deal with it? So, so I can get that started. I think, you know, um, I actually use, am in a lot of rooms while I'm the only female. And, and John knows this, and we've talked about it. Recently, we had a, a senior leader session um, with some of like the top product leader in the organization. I walked into a room. I opened the door. I was a little bit late. <laughs> and I opened the door, and the room gasped. <laughs> um, there was about 50 men in the room, and I was the only female. And so the guy who set up the meeting looked in the room. He looked at me. We all looked at each other. He's like... <laughs> And, and nobody noticed until I walked in, right? But yeah, but they were all guys. And then he looked at me, he's like, that's not good. <laughs> so I think sometimes people don't realize it's happening. So I think being, being there, representing it is one thing. And um, in a lot of situations, those interactions, I think once it happens, allows you to highlight and have the discussion about how 
being present and being having different personality to Mary's point, right, actually can deliver different values. I do think just the general climate and awareness is helping bring those conversations to the surface. So at least on the, you know, even if people don't notice it all the time, the desire and willingness to have more inclusivity, I feel the tide is changing and it's there, right? And the ability for us to actually engage in those conversations in an open way, in a non-biased way on our own and say, I know we didn't mean it, but this is just kind of how it looks like right now. What do we do about it, right? And I think the ability to be inclusive of the solution and to not pass judgment on how we got to where we are today, I think allows everybody to take the high road and look forward on what it needs to look like in the future. Right? And I think that, you know, the, num the biggest suggestion I would say in how do you engage in a discussion about somebody's bias is to be very, very kind about what their intent is, right? Even if you've felt it multiple times, even if you're like, God, that's so unfair. Oh, the minute you put them in an area where they don't have a chance to say, I didn't mean to do that, you get a very different reaction. And that's true, like I said, from a personal basis, whether it's interaction with your partners or, or your friends or, you know, like different kind of community member all the way to in a professional environment. And I'd like to add on, since you mentioned it, whether our, our male partners or husband experience bias as well, and I, I, I think everyone experiences it in some form, like it's, it's a segment that you belong to, that you're different. Um, men experience it with race as well, as well as um, if men have kids, there's unconscious bias with men have kids versus single men. So there, everyone everyone experiences it and, and it, we need to have that open conversation and and be receptive to that that they do feel it too anyone else You spoke a little bit about being the only. Um, help me understand your perspective on oftentimes being the only person in the room, the only, in my case, the only person of color, the sometimes the youngest person in the room, sometimes the person with the highest EQ in the room. <laughs> Good for um, you. <laughs> um, but help me understand your thoughts on being the only and, and representing all of those people um, you, you spoke about representing all the, the different aspects, representing all those people um, while still trying to be yourself and bring your 100% self in that situation or in that room. So I think um, two things, right? I'm going to say the first is it's important to know who you are, what you are and what you're not, right? You, the best way you can represent whoever you represent, whether that's color, right, ethnicity, age, or what it's still a version of you. It doesn't make everybody else who's Asian or female be like me, but, but it allows people to understand that no matter your color, um, your gender, right, your or your age, the individuality and the differences and the diversity is where it matters, right? So really a lot of the things that we talked about on biases, it's not about it can't be all men or it can't be all white or anything. It's, is that the lack of diversity impact outcome. So I think being able to demonstrate how that diverse opinion and approach can change the outcome is an important one. So that's number one. The second thing I would say is it does come down to choice, right? Just because sometimes it works doesn't mean it always works, right? And so you'll find yourself sometimes in an environment where you bring your true self and they don't want you. That's not what they want. And that's a call to action, right? If if you're being you and you're not acting or behaving because you're afraid of what people's expectations are or perceptions or, or because someone told you so and you're just being truthfully your value, your belief, and your talent and your skill and they're not interested, I guarantee you someone else is, right? And you're wasting their time and they're wasting your time. So I would say like, you know, if you run into a situation where you bring your true self and that's not being valued, there is a better place for you out there. And I've made multiple choices both personally and professionally, where I was being myself, and that wasn't, it wasn't right. It doesn't make them bad, but it wasn't right. right? And, I, and I think at that point, you have to make a choice 
of whether you continue in that environment, which is your choice to stay there. Right? So it's, it's hard to make that choice and say, well, they're not accepting me. Well, we know that. Right? So what are you going to do about it? And so I think making the choice when you try and it's not working is another important one. I would say when you find yourself being the only one who's represented in whatever group it is, sometimes it's welcome, sometimes it's not. This is a, a great conversation too, <laughs> and and I also think you just a lot of it is 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 competence and confidence, right? I, I can imagine you in a room with all these men, and even if they're all white, but to just you know smart, articulate, talented, and once you start talking, I think instead of looking at your exterior, they're going to start thinking about what you have to say and say, oh my God, that's really great. So I, I would encourage all of us, right, to say you have to be confident, you have to know your stuff, right, you have to be prepared. Sometimes we have to be more prepared than others, and so do your homework, but just be yourself and try not to get tripped up about that and just go in with the objective at hand and, and, and be yourself. And as like Ellen said earlier, right, sometimes even if you are all of that, all of your authentic self, you're still not accepted. There, are, there will be times. So you have to go back and think, how, how do, does it affect you? What is your goal here? Does it affect you so negatively that it's kind of not taking you to your goal? Or is there something that you can overcome this resistance by doing something differently and it still be you? So if it's actually hurting your goal and hurting what you want to do, then I would say definitely, as she said, there is a better place for you. Maybe this is not the right place. And it, you just have to kind of, I think, you know, sit back and think, was, is that right for me? And does that align with who I am and where I want to be? You can be at a certain place. There can be various paths. So this might not be it. Hi, I'm Savita. Um, I've been in the tech industry almost 20 years now, started in engineering, went to business school, after that worked overseas, I'm back here, and I find like I'm back in 98 sometimes, <laughs> that it's been over 20 years, and the progress hasn't happened, personally for me, right? Like I look at myself as a fresh engineer arriving here in Silicon Valley. Um, so the thing that I have realized, and so it's a, it's a comment, and I agree with 100% everything that you guys have said, because it's not just here in Silicon Valley. I've seen it in APAC, Singapore, Malaysia. Tell me, name it, which country I've seen it, right? And uh, you know, there's multiple layers of biases when you work abroad. Switzerland, yes, I left a business school because I didn't like how they treated women. And this is Switzerland, right? So, it's all over. So my thing that I have come to a conclusion, and I don't know, I'm kind of opening it up here, is that fundamentally the way, I'm trying to understand neuroscience also here, is fundamentally we were designed with unconscious bias. That's not fundamentally going to change because it's like 1,000 years of how the brain was wired to protect us from, to keep us safe. And that's where fundamentally some of these reactions are. I think the, what we as women need to learn, and some of it I think Ellen kind of beautifully put it there, is to how do we communicate much more effectively as individuals? Understanding that as the other person has bias, we carry our own biases as well on how we perceive and judge other people. Right? And it comes from that fundamental sense of safety and security. So that's my uh, add-on that I wanted to contribute, is to fundamentally learn ourselves and also, most importantly, teach our kids. I have a five-year-old girl, and I want, at least in the next 20 years, things to be different for her, <laughs> what I didn't have. And I want to make sure that we also talk about how we raise the next generation, on effective communications, because the bias is not going to disappear. Right, and I think um, when you catch yourself doing that bias, you can always correct and apologize. 
um, and that's the best way. Okay? I didn't mean that, or I phrased it wrong. Let me rephrase that. I do think, though, part of what the action has to be is there need to be more women at the top of the house. Because if, if you have more executive and C-suite women, they're going to be more inclined to have less of those unconscious biases and have more women like themselves be part of it. And so we, we saw the stats of the 1%. But if you look at the Fortune 500 companies, maybe there's one or two women CEO. And, it's, and, and the unconsciousness is, you know, I'm just going to go, we're going to go to play golf, or, you know, this is, I'm going to go down to so-and-so's office. It's just people are more comfortable with people like themselves and therefore have the tendency to then promote people like themselves. So what we have to do is start changing that. And it's up to us in our companies to really push leadership to have the training people like jen right to make sure our ceos are aware of this phenomena and we have to start getting more women in leadership positions we have to get them more on boards i mean there's a whole another conversation we can have and should have but uh, i was going to say the other thing that i feel like if you guys are whether you're a manager or you're in leadership is it's modeled behavior right like i and and you know those of my colleague at Clover and, and Pfizer in general would know I'm like unbashfully mommy, right? Like so, and I think a lot of times when to the point of being the only person in the room, you try to look like everybody else, right? And so whether it's if everyone go drinking, you go drinking, or everyone go golfing, you go golfing, or if everyone shows up at seven, you show up at seven, that actually doesn't help the diversity, right? Because what it does, it creates a perception that in order to be there, you wake up at seven, you leave at six. Like, I made a rule that between 7 and 8, my kid's at home. And like I said, like I'm co-parenting. There's time where I don't have my parents here. They're in Indonesia, so I'm on my own. <laughs> like, I'm it. I got to drop off. I get them ready to go to school. And, you know, if, if we have a Thursday night and it's my turn with the kids, they're right there. <laughs> so, so I think that, like, be authentically you because then you can actually represent the diversity. And it's a little bit unsettling, and people will look at you funny, but someone looking at you funny doesn't actually hurt you, right? And I think it's, it's being able to actually represent the diversity and not try to be in the room and try to look like everybody else is sort of the responsibility that all of us have here, right? Because I think historically everybody says, you know, and, and the female get to the leadership level and they try to look like everybody else, right? That doesn't help. So that's what I would say, I guess. Hi, um, thank you very much for sharing your personal stories. My question is about sort of change management. I was wondering if you could give an example at Clover of uh, things within the system that was broken that you got to fix. So system that accidentally had unconscious bias embedded in it uh, and affected people of color, women, uh, other uh, marginalized groups, um, and uh, you were able to address it. Uh, because I believe that it is the system we got to fix and not the women because we're, we're not broken. Thank you. Um, it's not my story. It's a story of my colleague. Last year, when I had my baby, another colleague of mine did too. I was lucky to have uh, a manager who was understanding and, you know, could support me through that, but she was not as fortunate. So often she used to get interrupted during her mommy duty times. And uh, she, she was scared. She did not want to bring it up. She was not a leadership level. She was not a manager. She was an individual contributor at a very early stage in her career. But then, um, you know, we talked about it often. We talked about it in mother's room. And uh, she kind of gathered the courage. I'm very, very, very um, proud of her to do that. And she brought it up to the management. She brought it up to John, I guess. And John took action in one day, and it was corrected for her. And uh, the leadership, which kind of created all that uncomfort, discomfort, did not value her as a mother, as a female, and did not support her, was corrected right then. 
like this is a story I know very personally for someone. Well, that concludes our panel for tonight. We still have plenty of networking and slag left to pick up. So enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you for coming to Clover.